thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so, as noted, the panel's title is Balancing Risk and Opportunity, the Power and Perils of Emerging Technology. Um, you know, it's sort of related to our broader theme of uh, today's event. So I don't think it needs too much further explanation. Um, you know, the whole thing is about AI, but I think what we'll try to do here is, is start a bit broader than that. I've asked our panelists to think of uh, something, you know, adjacent to AI or maybe completely unrelated that's underrated in the world of technology over the next 10 years. And then in the second half of the panel, we'll, uh, you know, we'll bring it back to the, um, the, the technology of the hour. Um, so briefly, just to introduce our panelists, uh, we have a very, very uh, great set of people with very different backgrounds, which is great. So first, um, Julian David, who's the chief executive of Tech UK. Uh, and then we have uh, Naina Bhattacharya, who is the chief information security officer of Danone. Next, uh, Dr. Christina Yan Zhang, the chief executive of the Metaverse Institute. And finally, Nicole Egan, chief strategy and AI officer of Darktrace. Um, so we have 40 minutes, uh, and I'd like to save the last five to 10 minutes for audience questions. So get those ready, and then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, call on people at the end. Uh, and I encourage the panelists to jump in fluidly to respond to your uh, fellow panelists' points throughout the conversation. You don't need me to call on you. Feel free to interrupt. We can keep it lively. Um, so as mentioned, I'd like to start by asking each of you, what's one example of an emerging technology, ideally not AI, but it could be related to it, uh, that you think is underrated, um, uh, but poses a, a big uh, potential for transformation um, over the next decade. Um, and maybe, Nicole, if I could start with you. Sure. Yeah. Um, is there anything but AI? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, in, in terms of related to AI and something that's truly underrated, um, it's pretty geeky, but there's something called vector databases. Uh, and I think what's so interesting about vector databases, they're already used today and associated with um, giving more context to large language models. But I think something we haven't all thought about yet is we're going to have all these large language models. There's going to be all this learning in these large language models. Where do we store it all? How do we query it? How do we understand the interrelationship between pieces of data in different large language models? And I think vector databases um, give a lot of the answer. And they're optimized for, for storage, for cost efficiency, for querying quality. Um, so today, I think you know, everyone associates like NVIDIA with being the big winner, right? Because we're all focused on the processing and compute powder power. But over time, it's going to be all about storage and sharing this information in vector databases. It's a great response because when you know, people use chatbots and you know, they have to retrieve documents, which documents you retrieve is so critical. Because if you retrieve the wrong ones, then your chatbot might not have the right context. So yeah, very interesting. Um, could I turn to you, uh, uh, Dr. Zhang? What's, what, what, what would you say is an underrated or uh, you know, critical technology for the next decade? Um, I would say brain computer interface. And you might remember that yesterday, there is a major announcement from Elon Musk, especially his Neuralink has put a live screen of the first successful implants of a human where he was paralyzed for more than a decade, but now he was able to use his thoughts through the computer chips in his brain to play chess games on the screen, which is really amazing. But bear in mind that Elon Musk is not really the first company who has been exploring that. There are already a large number of startups who have made major strike in that space, for example, another player called Sintron, they are using less invasive like brain-computer interface, which can go through your you know, blood vessel to connect it with your brain. And two years ago, they were able to allow a gentleman who was paralyzed to send out tweets to engage with the outside world. And they are now backed by both Jeff Bezos of Amazon and Bill Gates from like, uh, the foundation. But Personally, I think the most exciting bit is non-invasive brain-computer interface. In China, at Tsinghua University, they recently developed a new type of like, materials which you can put the brain-computer interface in a really elastic materials. You put it into your inside 
in the ear without no surgery, no operation at all. You can take it off, just like my pearl earrings, and you can wear it 24-7. And you can use that to provide stable transmission between your thoughts and the interface with any kind of digital future. And I think that can be truly transformational because a lot of brain-computer interface we're talking about now is for medical purpose to allow people who are paralyzed to work again, like the experiment did by Switzerland last year. And now, potentially, a lot of people are very excited about how Vision Pro, you know, like augmented reality, digital twins, is coming together with AI to provide industrialization, efficiency, operation, optimization. But imagine we having brain-computer interface as a 24-7, non-invasive, like almost like my Fitbit. Everyone can wear it. So we can use that to optimize any kind of industries in the years to come. That will be tremendously transformational for all of us. Very briefly, I have a quick follow-up. Um, when do you think this will be pervasive? Well, is it on the time scale of you know, several decades, within the decade? And then secondly, uh, you had alluded earlier when we were, we were chatting that you know, there's a connection between this and how we interface with AI. If you could maybe give, a, give our audience a preview of that. I would say on the medical field, it's already happening. In China, there is a hospital called Reijing. They already put nearly 30 brain-computer interface to treat people who are clinically diagnosed as depression and with a result of 60% improvement rates. So when you plug in, you're really happy. When you're plugged out, you're really not happy. <laughs> so the balance is, how do you want to make a balance to ensure they are not always super happy? Because no human beings can support that kind of situation. That's a very good you know, challenge we need to tackle. But go back to your question. I think for medical purpose, within five years, and really like a wide adoption within 10 years. Oh, that's exciting, um, but also a little scary. Um, uh, <laughs> Nana, could I, could, I, could I turn this to you? you know, what, what are you looking at in terms of an, an underrated uh, but potentially transformative technology on, on a decadal time horizon? I think um, from, from a professional uh, standpoint, I, I'm very excited about quantum computing. Uh, I just say, go ahead and say the word cryptography, um, and you're probably all thinking that just doesn't sound exciting at all. Uh, but you use it every single day when you send each other WhatsApp messages. Cryptography is what's protecting it. Uh, when you interact with your bank online, your uh, data is being kept secure through cryptography. And uh, what quantum computing is bringing to this game is that at this, at this point in time, most of the algorithms that are used for cryptography rely on the fact that it's very hard to factor large numbers. So it takes ages and ages to try and break it. But with quantum computing, this could happen very, very quickly. So one of the things that the industry is really working on is how do we build quantum safe cryptography uh, algorithms. So that's very exciting from a cybersecurity standpoint. At the same time, um, if you think about the possibilities that quantum computing brings into an area like cyber, like Nicole was saying, you have reams and reams and reams of data. How do you make sense of all of this data? And there's a potential with quantum computing to be able to really look into this very quickly and find where the, where the problems are. One of the issues in cybersecurity is that we um, are finding it very difficult to quantify risk. If you think of insurance, you have data on accidents, you have data on nat nat uh, natural disasters. We don't have enough data on cyber. And it could be truly transformative if we could quantify cyber risk and make investments on that basis rather than finger in the air. So I'm very excited uh, about quantum computing. Personally, though, I'm very, very excited about robotics. I love the fact that the vacuum cleaner can run around on its own. Uh, and I really want that technology to, to progress it in the future. Super interesting. Could I just ask a, a brief follow-up? Um, you, you mentioned quantification of, of uh, cyber risk. Why can't we just look at historical data or other companies and see how, how often incidents work? What's the difficulty there? Uh, the difficulty has been that uh, historically, if you look at the data before 2017 timeframe, it was not even front page news. It was only 2017 people started acknowledging this is a problem. So historically, it was a matter of shame. So we would hide this data. Uh, now governments are saying you have to report. And without the information uh, being out in the public domain, it's very difficult to collate all of that and make meaning out of it. And that's the, the real challenge. I'd also say in cyber, it's, it's playing off of that. It's, it, historical attacks have, are not a predictor of future. 
Um, so it's, it, even with the data, it's going to be very challenging. Especially when we have uh, a new technology that increases threat levels, which we will turn to in a, in a, in a second. But before that, uh, Julian, we'll, we'll end this uh, portion of the, of the panel with you. What, what are you looking at in terms of you know, so, an underrated technology? I mean, I would echo pretty much what, what the other panelists have said. But the thing that I think, it, not so much underrated, but underappreciated the necessity for, uh, and those of you UK-based, you may have seen that uh, the, the new government department, ARIA, is actually putting out a competition to address one of the biggest issues to do with the modern compute environment, which is energy usage and, and the, you know, the absolute amount of power that we are now bringing to, to uh, practical use. And that means, you know, I'm sure you all know about the Jevons paradox, which is uh, if you make something more efficient and you make it cheaper and you make it easier, People just use more of it. That's, that's applied throughout tech. And what that means is we've got to come up with a way to make the, the advances really eco-friendly, very low carbon usage, very low energy usage. And, and that's going to be one of the biggest things. It's also, of course, really important for distributed types of AI activity. You know, AI in your phone, AI in another device, AI in OT devices. These are not going to work unless we can manage to shrink some of the, model, the modules and the models down uh, so that they work and use less energy. That's a great example. I also think in order to deploy these models, that's going to be a, a factor because you know, the cost of inference and how much energy you need uh, can make it you know, prohibitive for a lot of applications. And as they get more powerful, you know, to, to, to solve the hardest or answer the hardest questions, you'll need more energy. So um, I'll stick with you. Uh, uh, Julian, because I have some AI-specific questions for each of you based on your, your, your background. Um, and one of the debates that you know, is very uh, hot right now in the, the AI and regulation world is over open source models. So you know, we have uh, Meta, uh, you know, they've released two versions of Llama. There's probably this year we're going to see a Llama 3, which you know, there are rumors it'll be at the capability level of GPT-4, which is OpenAI's current most advanced model. And that would be a huge advance for what the open source uh, world has access to, but you know, and that obviously has huge benefits for innovation startups getting access to frontier AI models. But it can also come with risks potentially uh, in in the the form of you know expanding capabilities to large numbers of people. You know, for example, um, you might you might think it's far fetched, but there are some serious people who think that with access to these models, you know, things like bioweapons and chemical chemical weapons might be more likely to be synthesized. So. You know, Julian, you, you see a lot of firms in this space. Mm -hmm. What's your sense of the debate on, on open source models? Um, are we at the point where we need to think about regulating them or not, not, not anytime soon? So, so look, I don't think we, uh, first of all, this is not a new debate. It's, it's really applied to every kind of technology that I've seen, you know, uh, as you can tell from the hair, I've been more than 30 years in, in, the, in the industry. And there is always that debate between openness and uh, security and reliability uh, and ownership. And it, it always comes to the same thing, which is uh, if you actually have, uh, say, a walled garden, you might think uh, perhaps one of the, you know, uh, iOS, for example, versus Android, then you get arguably a greater degree of security. You know who's sort of man uh, managing this, you know, you know what the philosophy behind it is. But equally, you don't get perhaps as much innovation and you do have the challenge of is, is, you know, is that person constraining what can be done because obviously they, you know, even if we're the best will in the world, they've got to put a resource in place to actually administer stuff. So, so that's, that's a continual debate and it's here now in AI. Um, and I don't think we know the answer. Um, you know, it, it is that thing, which is uh, if, you, if you make this stuff available, then people will innovate but maybe they'll also uh, take it into a, a less secure environment. If you keep it in, in you know, a few wall gardens managed by one or two companies in one or two uh, tech environments, then that's a challenge. And, and governments are looking at this, you know, how do they provide compute facility and how do they provide an AI environment that lots of people can work in, particularly SMEs and innovators. Uh, so it's it's a, unfortunately it's a balance, Arjun. I don't think we know. 
I suspect both models will survive. Do any of our other panelists have views on this uh, open source debate? Um, I'm a big fan of open source. Uh, I used to work with the company that brought Java into the world, and the idea was interoperability. And the idea was, how do we make this available widely and make it available for free? But we've also seen the, the risk with that kind of a model. In, in the end of 2021, um, another unglamorously named thing called Log4j appeared on the scene, right? And um, a few newspapers and magazines said the internet is on fire. And what it was, was it was a vulnerability. It's like an open window in, in some logging software in Java, right? Very simple in, in, in that conceptually. But the big question was, who is responsible for fixing this because Java is open source? And what timeline will they fix it in? And since this was so unknown, we were all scrambling to fix it in our own organization. So there's a risk to open source. There's definitely more innovation, but it has to be done in a very balanced way. It's a really interesting point where maybe it's easier to identify the vulnerabilities when the code is on the, out in the open, uh, but then the question is who's responsible for it. <laughs> um, um, so I, I want to stick on the on the theme of, of cybersecurity and, and you know ask uh, you a question, Nicole. Um, you know you're at Dark Dark Trace, which leading cyber, cybersecurity company. You kind of have a front row seat into the vulnerabilities that enterprises are are facing. We've had about a year and a half of uh, ChatGPT uh, now since it's gone mainstream. How big of an impact has it had on? Uh, the, the firms you work with, you know, has there been a huge increase? Uh, how is that evolving over time? And what's your kind of outlook for threats sure. caused by Gen AI? So we started once ChatGBT adoption hit a million users, and then it very quickly went to 100 million. We went back during that same time period and looked across the threats that we saw across Darktrace customers in terms of AI models triggering on it. Um, and there was a 135% increase um, just between a million to 100 million adoption uh, in terms of uh, cybersecurity attacks. And the majority of that was in email phishing. That's why I think we hear so much more now about email phishing and social engineering uh, phishing attacks. Now, that 135% spike did not sustain. Uh, we ran that again uh, the last quarter of last year, and it was still, though, at a 35% increase off of a, a much larger base. So um, it is having a real impact. I mean, it's... Uh, it's um, still early days in that, you know, most of it is right now social engineering, phishing, reconnaissance, researching targets. But, you know, we're starting to think about what is the next flavor going to look like? You know, what happens when you have generative AI mal malware learning more about how to become better malware, right? Kind of what we often refer to as kind of headless attacks, where a human isn't on the other end of command and control. Um, so we're still in the early days, but we have already seen and started to see an impact. Super interesting. So kind of a autonomous um, agent, AI agent. That's right. Exposing yeah. vulnerabilities. Um, I, I just be curious, that, that, that big increase that seems to maybe not increasing as fast, but it's still growing. Um, how big of an impact has that had on, on firms? And, and then uh, uh, Naina, I'm going to turn to you in a second, because you're, you're on the receiving end of this. Um, are you seeing it having a big effect on, on the bottom line? Is it changing firms' investment behavior in, in um, cybersecurity and so forth? Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's um, you know, just to stick with the phishing email, so that's where we're seeing it first. Just think about that email security person or team you know, inside your company. Um, you have two things happening. One is the volume of attacks and sophistication right, are going up. So that's putting a burden on them. But the other thing that's happening is we've done all this security awareness training, and that's great. But what it's actually done is there's an over-reporting by employees of things they think are a phishing attack. In fact, 90%, nine out of every 10 emails an employee submits would not have done any damage. Oh. But so you've got the volume just overloading from both sides, right? The attack volume and the, the reporting from employees. So I think one of the things that we've seen is if you can take the AI, not just give it to the security team, put AI in every employee's inbox. And actually, when you, you get a suspicious mail, have the AI do the background check for you and kind of say, this is concerning, or this is why it's concerning, or hey, this looks legit. So I think it's, it's, it's going to change the whole paradigm where it's not just the security team using security tools. I think every employee is going to have AI helping them out. 
super interesting. So there's kind of this race with both sides adopting AI. Uh, um, uh, Naina, you, you're uh, you know on the receiving end of, of of these types of attacks. Is that is that how you're seeing things evolve? Are, are you are you have you been able to effectively use AI for 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 defense and um, you know, um, um, how are you? How are you seeing the threat level increasing or, or decreasing over the future? I, I want to answer this question a, a bit. Sorry, was that for me? For you. Yes, for you. Thank Anna. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I, I want to answer this question as a, as a practitioner and and as a user of AI because I think there are slightly two different hats. Um, as a practitioner, of course, I, I work with a team of ethical hackers and they want to see what can we break, right? Um, and one of the things that AI makes very easy is writing tailored phishing emails. So all that training we used to do on lookout for spelling errors and things like that is a thing of the past, right? It's super easy, super, super, super fast. We can also take bits of malware and change that malware really rapidly as well. So we can make variants of, of the malware, it makes it very difficult to detect. So that's the other issue uh, that we are facing. And the third issue that we are facing is this idea of deep fake. And as the kids say, right, there's an app for that. You can literally download an app, not from legitimate sources, but that will give you a deep fake as long as you have a few pictures of a certain person. There's been a recent incident when um, it looked like a CFO of a company was talking to their employee and they gave a payment of about 25 million, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So that's kind of what we are dealing with now. And there's no real technological solution for that. So we just have to say, double check, make sure it, it's the right people. So there's a lot of focus on awareness uh, at this point in time. As a, um, as a user of AI, I love what machine learning uh, kind of algorithms are doing for the cybersecurity profession. Earlier, it would all be pattern-based, right? Antivirus would look at known bad things and say, okay, that's a known bad thing, I'm gonna block it. Now we're able to look at behavior and say, okay, this machine is behaving in a very weird way, this doesn't make sense, let me stop it. So what that means is uh, my, my small team can focus on advanced problems and leave a lot of the day-to-day -day kind of response to technology. And that's why I really love the potential of AI uh, for cybersecurity in, in that way. Interesting. Do you want to add? I actually want to chip in there because, I mean, there has been a lot of discussion about how to use blockchain's ability to trace verification to counteract all the potential risk to do with deep fake. And I know there's a number of companies, research institutions in different parts of the world are actively looking into that space to provide the opportunity to tell people, organization, what is real, what is fake. Because what we notice, Julian, you probably know this very well, from a legislation perspective, you know, a number of governments, they are actually mandates the social media platform to watermark any kind of content which is generated through AI, which I think is a, a short-term solution. But the issue is the ability of generative AI to use text form to create text, images, videos, 3D objects, 3D environments, 3D avatars at scale, which is going to grow exponentially to the point we are going to feel very overwhelmed every day with too many information, which we can't tell what is right, what is wrong. And then at that point, maybe government might start thinking about, let's um, label all the content created by human, because there will be far more you know, content created <laughs> by AI. It's impossible to manage. And then how do we deal with that? Blockchain, if you link that with any kind of text image, 3D objects, you know, et cetera, you can use that to do verification in a really scalable way on a global scale. So potentially, if we're going to see another, you know, photo shoot of Donald Trump, you know, being captured, you know, by the police going viral, we can, you know, see behind that, you know, image, the blockchain, you know, backed image, is that really created by AI? or human. So I think from a regulatory perspective and industry perspective, that can be hugely powerful in the years to come. So uh, just, just to pick up on that, um, I think one of the things that, that, that the power of compute, uh, and that includes AI and includes quantum, all, all these things do, is it really lifts up the magnitude of things we already know are issues. So who actually posted that, that post? Um, why are they, you know, 
how do we know whether what they're saying is true or false? How do you uh, manage streams of information? You know, it, it's uh, the, the, the sort of sources of uh, verified information, which we've relied on for so long, the national broadcasters, the government, etc. They're not, uh, they're not holding the, the, the court anymore. It's, it's other areas. So, but what uh, the advance in technology does is, as you say, and as, as you said, it just means it's really, really fast and really, really believable. So I do think, and this came out in the, in the Bletchley Park Summit last year, that, that we're really going to have to start to think about some fundamental things for, for safety. I mean, we've, you know, we've got an AI um, uh, safety uh, group, and so do they have in the US. Other countries at the summit said, we've got something that looks the same. We might not call it a uh, safety institute, but, but I do think these, these questions are going to really crank up. I don't. I mean, I don't know how much time we got left, Arjun. But we, we can keep going. Yeah. This is supposed to be opportunities as well as risks. Yeah, please. It? So I, I give us think, the positives. <laughs> I do think we should. You know, there are some. There's some real issues here about trust and transparency, which have got to be addressed. Uh, and the way to address those is actually going to be to use the technology, as you've all implied. But we shouldn't miss the fact that there are some fantastic opportunities. You've probably been hearing that in other sessions. So it's it's really a case of. How do you keep humans in control? How do you get the right sort of regulation? And maybe there needs to be a bit more control over, uh, you know, the, the idea that you don't have to identify yourself, that the internet is, is for everybody, um, and you can have different personas on it. So these things may become untenable. I think one of the things that this topic brings up, and we we're talking about a, a, the grand scale of the internet and social media, but it applies to every single business, and that is, foundation of data and content that's created, I think one of the things we're going to see over you know, the next 12, 24, 36 months, we have to recognize that data is the heart of everything to do with AI, right? Um, and whether it's the data it's training off of or the, the data it's using to create something, we're going to really start paying a lot more attention, I think, to data governance, yeah. right? Um, the, the new category is going to be data security. Everything's going to be about data governance. And what I mean by that it's going back to the original creation of a piece of data. It's then looking at everybody who touched that data, how it was used, what, it, what systems it, it uh, used to train, um, any changes that were made. And I think companies are starting to realize already that they have to really, you know, if you don't have a chief data officer looking at this, if you're not looking at data governance, this is, I know it sounds boring, it sounds mundane. Just think about it this way. If you don't have proper data governance and all of a sudden you allow your employees to start using variations, chat GBT and all the variations, right? And the related apps to it. They all of a sudden might be able to see data that is sensitive inside your company that they didn't know they had access to before. And that's just a very simplistic example, but we're seeing that happen quite broadly at the moment. Um, so. Uh, and some of that data could, who knows, lead to insider trading or, or cause other regulatory issues. So I think um, this brings the fundamentals back to you know, data governance, whether it be on a scale like social media and the internet or whether it's inside of every company. That's a great point. You know, all these corporations want to create corporate models that are you know, pointed at internal data, but then what's the permissioning on which you know, internal data for whom and so forth. Um, I'm going to turn to some of the, the audience questions because we have a few minutes left. Can we, can we go to that third one? Uh, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> Perfect. I, I like uh, it too. So the question is, what is the panel's view on the need for AI charters for colleagues that set out expectations for leveraging AI and expectations on doing so uh, responsibly, responsibly? Okay, AI charters for colleagues. Uh, who wants to take that, please? Well, let me say, we, we are just doing that at Tech UK. Tech UK is the trade association for digital tech companies. And we actually have decided we need to spell out how we're using AI as well as controlling how we use it. Uh, your point about you know, uh, putting your data into an open environment um, is a real issue, and I'm not sure everybody's understood that. But I also think the point of saying, well, did you write that or did the machine write it? Um, it, it there, there's a basic point here about keeping the human uh, control and keeping the human trust. And I think a charter is a, is a really interesting way to do it. A group of us uh, CISOs got together in the early days when um, this, this was coming out, and we said, w how do we write this, and how do we make it useful for 
uh, for the wider industry. And uh, of course, we, we said the use cases, how do we use ChatGPT? And so we got ChatGPT to write the first version. Mm -hmm. And it was a pretty good first version. Um, we have since moved on and, and, um, uh, and written something very specific to our organization. But to Nicole's point earlier, if you're thinking of uh, putting some AI into your organization, it's a very good idea to let some ethical hackers have a crack at it first. Let them see what they can get to. For our case, for example, it's a 100-year-old company. We don't know what has been left open with what kind of permissions. Yeah. And we don't know what might be discoverable. And it's worries like uh, we make baby food. We don't want a lot of that sensitive data around babies to, to be available widely. So think about those use cases and, and really target some uh, ethical hackers into this, uh, into this exercise. Is that ethical hacking? So kind of like red teaming, getting, yeah. It's, it's like it. a red teaming. Yeah. So uh, you have people with uh, hacking skills, but they do it. Uh, according to your specification, so they will not go outside of the boundaries uh, that you specify. Makes sense. Technically. We have a question on, uh, we discussed a bit about, about phishing earlier. Um, I think we, we sort of touched on, you know, how, how we can stay vigilant um, as, as attacks become more personal and sophisticated. But, um, you know, Nicole or Nida, was there anything more you wanted to add on this in terms of when you're you would, how you would advise under other enterprises to, to kind of prepare for this. I think we also think, uh, you know, we, we focus on email a lot. It's also um, within companies, it's collaboration systems like Slack and Teams. The, that's the new attack vector that the attackers are pivoting into. And just remember, especially when it's between colleagues, what the attackers are doing is they're inserting themselves inside a conversation between two colleagues. And there's a trust between those colleagues. And now those colleagues just assume there's, there's that trust and they don't realize that somebody's actually impersonating them or has inserted themselves in that dialogue. So it's, um, it, again, I think the answer has to be AI flagging it <laughs> for the humans because how else are we gonna know that somebody just uh, took over and is impersonating? But, and that's the scary thing is like, we, we actually, uh, we created offensive AI in our labs to make our defensive AI better. And one of the things we've been able to do now is figure out a safe way to let companies um, have AI insert itself in its own employees' communications to test what would happen. So it's really the, it's thinking backwards, like what would the damage be done? So, okay, somebody inserts themselves in a conversation between these two colleagues, what happens next? Is there an attack path that attacker can leverage? They're not there just to sit and listen to you chit chat, right? What is it they're after? They're after what's called like escalating privileges, lateral movement. They're trying to go after the crown jewels of your business or take some system down. So one of the things we do is we actually allow this AI phishing simulation to happen and we model what the impact is. And then we figure out how to harden using AI algorithms, how to harden and make those critical attack paths safer. That's very, very innovative strategy for, for kind of, I guess, doing your internal red teaming in a sense. Um, Could I quickly add Please, that? yeah, yeah. Um, a, a couple of very practical things, right? One is in the 1990s, we were worried about spam. Now, if you look at your personal email, spam filtering has got really, really good, right? The good news is email security has also got really, really good. So please use some good email security tools. It's a bit expensive, but that really helps. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other thing is then you can focus more the awareness piece on, uh, on the emerging stuff like deep fake. Getting the C-suite to say, we will never talk to you um, in this manner. We will never ask you to secretly talk to my lawyer uh, has been very powerful in our case. Yeah. Great. I want to ask Dr. Zhang about this, uh, this, this question because you, you were referring to you know, some lot, many, many different futuristic technologies before. Um, what would you use the, the Eisenbard AI supercomputer due to launch in Bristol this summer if you were in charge? What would you use it for? Oh, good question. Um, I think at this moment, the most urgent issue all of us facing is climate change, especially global warming. If you're traveling around different parts of the world, one thing you feel quite strongly is getting hotter and hotter each passing day. I personally, I'm very foodie, and I really like steamed dumplings. But the issue is <laughs> when you become the steamed dumplings in the bamboo case, that's not really a good idea. So if I have the chance to use that supercomputer, I'm going to create 
a simulation of the whole destination Earth, like the European Commission has already been doing, and they want to use that to make European continents the first climate neutral you know, continent in the world by 2050. Well, no part of Europe anymore, but we have some of the best technologies, whether it's content, high performance computing, you know, AI, etc. I don't know why, maybe like Tech UK as one of the most influential, you know, tech organization in this country can take a lead to lobby whoever is going to be the next prime minister this year to set up the UK's first <laughs> digital earth fighting climate change and make the UK the first climate neutral uh, country in the world by 2030. How does that sound to you? <laughs> sounds, no sounds, sounds like an opportunity or a, or a challenge. Um, just to pick up on the, both those questions, really important. Look, I, open it up to as wide a, a group of, of people as possible would be what I would say on the, on the use of the computer. We've got a very small amount of, of um, of high performance computing accessible in the UK. So these two new, this one and the one in Edinburgh, are the existing ones. Let's make sure that innovators can access this stuff. Connect it with the universities that are working on things. Let's have some themes as well. You know, climate change is a great one. Um, equally, um, you know, medical advances. Um, and there are other industries there. I would also say we need to start thinking about defense in a different way because you know, it's a dangerous world and we need to actually understand some of the stuff that's going on with these technologies uh, in, in that space. And, and then I think if you do that, um, you know, you'll actually get an environment in which the UK's natural capability for innovation, research and cleverness will come through. So yeah, make it around some themes um, and, and let's go for it. Lastly, I just wanted to say on who's responsible for AI within an organization, the CEO, end of. I think that's a good place to, to call it because we're running a little bit over time. Uh, but, but I like how we kind of turn the, the, the discussion towards the you know, opportunities towards the end to kind of balance out the, 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 the risk throughout. So um, with that, why don't we give our uh, panel a, a round of applause. Thank you.